capital gains that arise in a local trust and are awarded to a non-resident beneficiary of that local trust are taxed in the local trust. There's no such similar provisions for income that is earned by the local trust and is awarded to a non-resident beneficiary during the same year of assessment. It has been announced in the budget speech that consideration will be given to aligning the treatment for capital gains and for income, and we expect to see legislative amendments that will result in income arising in a local trust and being awarded to a non-resident beneficiary of that trust during the same year of assessment being taxed in the local trust. South African multinationals with subsidiaries in foreign jurisdictions are subject to a complex set of rules in the Income Tax Act called Controlled Foreign Company Rules. Part of these rules provide that any income earned in that foreign jurisdiction by that subsidiary must be imputed back to the resident in South Africa on which they then are subject to tax. Now, in an interesting decision handed down in November of last year, the South African Revenue Service was successful in upholding an assessment against the taxpayer, Coronation Fund Managers in South Africa, on the basis that they didn't meet the criteria necessary to have a foreign business establishment. The key issue in that particular decision was the fact that certain functions had been outsourced to a different entity within the group in a different jurisdiction and therefore didn't actually have the substance necessary in that particular country. The country in question was Ireland. Now, despite SARS winning that particular case, and despite that case being a Supreme Court of Appeal decision, they have still sought, as part of the budget review, to introduce changes to the Income Tax Act, and specifically, the definition of a foreign business establishment, to ensure that activities which are outsourced are not able to benefit from the particular exemption. It'll be interesting to see how these changes are brought about and implemented in the coming year. So the FATF is the Financial Action Task Force. It is an intergovernmental policy-making body that's sponsored by the G20, and in particular the G7 within the G20. And it seeks to encourage countries to improve their anti-money laundering laws and of course, money laundering includes tax evasion. So there is a tax link to this. And the FATF encourages countries to do peer reviews of each other. South Africa was a founder member of the FATF. Now, South Africa has never been peer reviewed in all the existence of the FATF. And last year we were peer reviewed for the first time. And shockingly, over a hundred deficiencies were identified in our anti-money laundering rules. These deficiencies were substantive in the sense that um, they included deficiencies in legislation as well as deficiencies in the government departments and organizations not policing the laws that we already have. So in other words we had too few laws or insufficient laws and those laws that we had weren't policed properly. So I, I think the, the one item that everybody was expecting and was looking forward to was the relief for renewable energy expenses um, and the relief that came through in the budget um, was really impressive for businesses but not so for, for natural persons. Businesses will be able to claim 125% of their expense on renewable energy um, and they can claim it immediately in the same tax year. Um, natural persons can only claim a maximum of 15,000 rand, and if one keep in mind the cost of these um, installations, then it is really not sufficient as an incentive. Uh, you will have heard from Dooley about the uh, uh, incentives given for solar, but here's a bit of a, an interesting fact, um, a rather intriguing fact. For, indivi for individuals, um, you won't be getting a tax deduction, you'll be actually getting a reduction of your tax liability equal to 25% of the cost of the solar up to a maximum of 15,000 Rand. But it's being made very clear that the, 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 it's limited to the cost of the solar panels only, not the inverter and not the battery. 
Um, and here's a bit of an intriguing question. In South Africa, we use alternating current. Solar panels produce direct current. If you don't have an inverter, those solar panels will just look good and help you keep up with the Joneses, but they're not going to produce electricity. So how they could have excluded the inverter is uh, a, a bit of a mystery. Um, one of the other announcements was the extension and improvement of the research and development allowance. For those of you who have um, experienced the joy in trying to apply for approval to get uh, the R&D allowance, you'll, notice, you'll have noticed uh, that there are, there are a number of hurdles to, uh, to be overcome. Um, they have indicated that they're going to make it uh, user -friendly, more user-friendly in certain circumstances. And the other good news is they're extending it for another 10 years. Um, similarly, for those in the property field, the Urban Development Allowance was uh, supposed to terminate at the end of uh, this month, next month, um, because of ongoing discussions as to uh, the allowance generally. They've extended it for two years until they come to a final uh, conclusion on it. The Income Tax Act contains special provisions which find application where a non-resident company becomes a South African resident company. And uh, in the era of globalization, it's quite easy to appoint a different board of directors of a non-resident company. In other words, you put on South African directors and you manage it from South Africa, and all of a sudden you've got a South African company. So what these provisions do is twofold. Firstly, they deem the non-resident company, which is now South African resident company, to have obtained a step up in the base cost of its worldwide assets up to the market value of those assets. That's step one. Step two is that the contributed tax capital of this new immigrant company is stepped up to the market value of the shares in that company. So there is apparently a perceived abuse We've got a multi-tiered structure. The example given um, in the budget review is a three-tiered structure. We've got a non-resident holding company, which holds all of the shares in a non-resident intermediary company, which in turn holds shares in various South African subsidiaries. And the perceived abuse is that that non-resident intermediary company becomes a South African tax resident, and therefore it obtains a step up in the base cost of its worldwide assets, as well as in the CTC. What then happens is that the operating profits of these valuable operating companies are distributed up to the intermediary holding company, and that intermediary holding company then uses its step-up CTC to return those profits on a tax-free basis up to its non-resident uh, shareholder. So there's apparently some amendments that will be forthcoming in the new legislative cycle, which will be aimed at curbing this perceived abuse. In this year's budget, we've also seen uh, two concessions relating to fuel. The first is to keep the fuel levy uh, at the same levels that it was in the last two years. So for a very minor increase in the carbon fuel levy, and SARS has also granted a diesel levy rebate to manufacturers of uh, food products. In our view, this is in line with the intent of the rebate because you shouldn't be paying road accident fund levies and the like on fuel used to uh, fuel generators for these manufacturers. In this budget, uh, government has uh, given some relief to taxpayers with regard to fuel. Uh, given that the fuel prices remained above 20 rand a litre, it's been decided to leave uh, the fuel levy rates where they were for the last two years, uh, except for a very minor increase in the carbon fuel levy. There's also been a concession given to uh, food product manufacturers with regard to the diesel levy rebate. Again, this is because of the uh, electricity generation crisis, and effectively it will mean that uh, these food stuff manufacturers won't pay the uh, road accident fund levy and the like on fuel which is used to keep the operations going uh, with generators. The Minister of Finance spoke to the adoption of a strategy aimed at building a financial system that is less susceptible or vulnerable to abuses. Now, this has been characterized by the review of the current and existing anti-money laundering regime and enforcement regimes. Now, this is also part of an international strategy aimed at preventing the illicit funneling of funds into 
terrorism. Now, since its inception in the country, it has been characterized by the close supervision of financial institutions, together with a range of other non-financial businesses and professions, such as state agents or providers of crypto assets. Now, with the focus on crypto assets, this could be a signal of the encouragement of the use of crypto assets, whilst also emphasizing regulation and oversight and control over their use. Now, part of the measures adopted by the, um, by the government in the budget review include declaring crypto asset providers as accountable institutions. Secondly, oversight and regulation by the FIC. And thirdly, regulation by the South African Reserve Bank to ensure that transactions comply with the exchange control regulations. So in the normal course, uh, individuals tax years run from 1 March of one year to 28 Feb of the following year. This is slightly different for individuals who cease to be tax resident because they deem to have a year of assessment from 1 March up until the day before they cease to be tax resident and then a new year of assessment from the day that they cease to be tax resident to 28 Feb of the following year. What happens is the Income Tax Act allows for a number of annual exemptions and annual exclusions that individuals can claim in each year of assessment. So what individuals were doing that cease to be residents who now effectively had two years of assessment is that they were claiming these exemptions and exclusions twice in one 12 month period. So during 2022, there were some legislative changes. Um, basically the interest, the annual interest exemption was, it was made clear that you could only claim it once in a 12 month period. And the same with the annual capital gains exclusion. However, it came to government's attention that not all the provisions in the act were remedied accordingly. And so they're now making changes just to make sure that annual exemptions and exclusions are all going to be treated the same when it comes to individuals who cease to be residents. One of the announcements in the budget speech today was that the government will be publishing its draft legislation on Pillar 2 later this year as part of its annual legislative cycle. Pillar 2 is one of a two-pillar solution put together by the OECD's inclusive framework to address challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. Worksman's attorneys, keep us close.